Greetings, good afternoon, and welcome. My name is Lissa Polish. I'm the director of the Clean Energy Resource Teams, or CERTS. Welcome to our Energy Futures session focused on the future of renewable energy siting in Minnesota and across the Midwest. Thanks so much for joining us. We are excited to be hosting an exceptional lineup of speakers this afternoon to explore this topic. As a reminder for folks who may be joining us for the first time for an energy futures session, these are short 45 minute little snippets of energy conversation. And the whole idea really is to focus on conversation, allowing all of us to learn from different perspectives on a topic related to where we're headed around clean energy and to consider the different implications of energy futures, including on the role of communities in these sessions. And today that is indeed the focus. We know that lots of people have been thinking about the build out of renewable energy on the landscape. This is likely to be a big change for folks in Minnesota and across the Midwest. And for folks who attended our Energy Futures session in February, one of the things that we talked about was this Minnesota Solar Pathway study that had been looking at different scenarios for how that renewable energy build out would go. And a number of us in CERTS, as we had been learning about the results, and maybe many of you, had this moment of like, wow, there are lots of studies coming out talking about the potential, but where is that stuff actually gonna get built? <laughs> and, and how will that work on the ground? And, and over time, we've started to hear from different kinds of folks like farmers who are wondering about how is that gonna work for my land, for community groups wondering about how is that gonna work for that local park or that natural habitat area that we've really focused our attention on. And these are all super great questions. And they're, they're the things that we seek to really dig into today and really surface some different ideas about, well, how can we think about that? And how can we center some of those questions as we do this planning? So the big question that we posed to our guests coming into today's session was, how can we effectively site and build out the solar and wind energy we need to reach increasingly ambitious clean energy targets while preserving farmland, expanding habitat and maintaining the sense of place that communities have come to appreciate. So for all of you attending, thanks so much for being here. Um, as you have questions that you're thinking about that you really wanna surface, feel free to just pop them into the Q&A. We always try to tackle a few of them during these sessions. Um, and we also do some follow-up responses to those questions in the blog after the event. And with that, I will introduce our speakers. Um, we are delighted to have all three of you today. Um, Nathan Cummins is the Nature Conservancy's Great Plains Renewable Energy Strategy Director. In this role, Nathan leads renewable energy strategy and policy for TNC's Great Plains state chapters, focusing on accelerating renewable energy deployment while protecting lands and waters throughout the region. Prior to this position, Nathan worked for six years in the Conservancy's External Affairs Department, where he focused on corporate engagement and infrastructure policy. Before joining the Nature Conservancy, Nathan worked at the White House Council on Environmental Quality on public engagement with key Obama administration environmental initiatives. Nathan holds a bachelor's degree from DePaul University and an MBA from Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. Welcome, Nathan. Um, next up, Brian Ross. Brian is a vice president at the Great Plains Institute, leading GPI's renewable energy market transformation efforts in the Midwest and nationally. Brian joined the Institute after 20 years as a consultant working with local, regional, and state governments on climate and energy planning, policy, and regulation. He managed stakeholder engagement and technical committee facilitation for the Minnesota Solar Pathways Project, identifying barriers and solutions to deep penetration of renewable energy in Minnesota and the Midwest. He currently directs GPI's technical assistance for the national effort SolSmart, a certification program for local governments. He helps to lead national research efforts on integrating renewable energy development with natural systems and for water quality benefits, and is developing work on non-electric integration of renewable energy systems. Brian, I, I feel like that's like code for hydrogen and ammonia, but we'll come back to that another time. Welcome. Um, and finally, um, Sarah Mills. Sarah is a senior research area specialist and lecturer at the University of Michigan, where she leads the Graham Energy Futures Initiative and a grant from the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy to help communities across the state of Michigan consider clean energy in their land use planning, zoning and other policymaking. Her research and teaching has included how renewable energy development impacts rural communities, positively and negatively, 
the disparate reactions of rural landowners to wind and solar projects and how state and local policies facilitate or hinder renewable energy development. Sarah received her doctorate in urban and regional planning at the University of Michigan, where her dissertation looked at the impact that wind energy projects have on farming communities. She has a master's in engineering for sustainable development from the University of Cambridge and a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Villanova. She grew up on a farm in rural Michigan, so she knows that landscape well, but she now lives in the city of Ann Arbor where she chairs the planning commission. Welcome to all three of you. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we are gonna start with a lightning round. Um, I, I'm really hoping that that really does mean fast, um, but we're gonna focus on that big question that we posed initially to help everybody here really get a sense for where you're coming from as you think about this topic. So Sarah, I'm gonna ask you to go first and maybe tell the group, what would you emphasize as essential to responding to that question? How can we effectively site and build out solar and wind energy that we need to reach our increasingly ambitious clean energy targets while preserving farmland, expanding habitat and maintaining that sense of place. What would you share? Sure. So I think one of the things that's really important to ground the conversation is, and why you bring up farmland preservation, is that wind and solar aren't usually cited in the same places where an existing coal or natural ga gas plant is. There's just not enough land on those sites. And so instead, wind and solar are typically located in more rural areas where you think about farmland preservation. Um, this move of energy generation to rural areas, I would say presents rural communities with a great economic opportunity. They, wind and solar projects typically lease land from landowners and so they're paying those landowners. Wind and solar projects also pay taxes that go to fund local government services and schools. So it can really be a huge boon to rural communities. Um, I would say it's maybe the biggest economic opportunity that rural communities have seen in decades. But I think it's also really important to remember and ground our conversation that every energy generation facility has positive and negative impacts on the local community where it's hosted. Um, and at the very least, a wind or solar farm is a change to the immediate landscape. And so I think it's really important for communities to have conversations ahead of time about how and where renewable energy fits into their goals for their community. How those positives, whether and where positives outweigh the negatives. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Brian, coming to you next, what would you emphasize to sort of help people think about where you're coming from as you think about this build out and preserving these other aspects? Uh, one of the things to keep, I think that we really need to keep in mind as we kind of go, go through this big belt out or visualize it out is that the host communities for the, for the energy system of the past were places where centralized power plants were located. There were places where fossil fuel um, uh, resources were located and there's mining and extraction, uh, which were a, a relatively small number of communities. Um, and the energy system of the future is going to be very different. It's going to be solar and wind focused. And in particular with the solar resource, it's not in one place or a limited number of places. It's everywhere. And, and, and the, the upshot of that is, is that all communities are going to be asked to be host communities. Uh, it used to be just a few communities. Now it's going to be all communities. Uh, all communities have a solar resource. All communities will see solar development. Some will see a lot of it. Some will see less of it, but everyone's going to host it. And as a consequence, we need to make sure, as with the, the old energy system, we need to make sure that communities are benefiting from that in some way so that they're partners and they develop that social license to operate that development needs to in order to kind of see the large scale deployment that we want to see. Mm. Wonderful. And we're going to come back to that social license to operate. So good. Good for teeing that up. Um, Nathan, how about you? What would you really, what would you emphasize as essential to getting this mix right? Well, beyond what Sarah and Brian have shared, I would say, you know, it's important for us to focus on the opportunity to advance both a clean and green renewable energy build out. So what do I mean by that? Well, first off, Renewable energy is critical to tackling climate change and can provide a host of benefits to both the communities and the environments it's around. Um, that's sort of the clean side of the equation. 
But however, as Sarah mentioned, like any energy system, there are trade-offs that need to be considered. Um, it, with renewables, they can have significant both direct and indirect impacts on the landscape and wildlife just due to the amount of land that's needed to, to make these systems work. And these can cause conflicts and conflicts cause delays. Given the immediacy of the climate challenge, we, we cannot afford these delays. So we need to think about getting projects on the ground that are both clean and then also green that are cited in these ways that avoid um, these high impact wildlife and conservation areas. Luckily, we've done the analysis. There's, there's a lot of, um, as Brian was saying, there, there's a lot of wind and solar resource out there and there's a lot of lands that have relatively low conservation value, all things considered. So we have more than enough opportunity out here to develop renewable energy on lands that are low impact for nature and for communities and get the renewable energy we need. So we think there is a huge opportunity here for both this clean and green uh, build out. I like that framing, Nathan. And, and as we start to then dig more deeply, maybe we'll start with you because, I mean, you started saying like, we've done, we've done the studies. Um, and I know that your colleague, Jessica Wilkerson, I've heard her say something like the top line message needs to be that it is technically feasible to reach high levels of renewable energy in the next decade and do so while protecting wildlife and habitat, but we need to get the incentives right. So there's a lot in that statement and you've started to touch on it, but I'm hoping that you can sort of dig in a little bit and and you know, sort of describe how the Nature Conservancy is, is coming to these issues and thinking about siting, but help everybody attending understand when we talk about high level of renewables, like what does that mean? <laughs> like in Minnesota and the Midwest, like how much is that? And when you say it's technically feasible, like what do you mean by that? Let's start with that half of that statement. Yeah, of course. You know, so when we think about my organization, the Nature Conservancy, our mission is to, is to protect the lands and waters upon which all life depends. We're science-based organizations. We have a local to global approach to conservation. And we recognize that climate change is an immediate threat to our mission and more broadly, just the livelihoods of both people around the world and, and the nature that we depend on. If we can't keep global warming to under 1.5 degrees Celsius, you know, we're in for a big issue. So we think it's really important to be taking on renewable energy and getting as much renewables out there as possible. That being said, at the same time, we also have a biodiversity crisis happening that we need to recognize, you know, and this is thinking about globally, but even here in the central United States, you know, we have less than 5% of our native prairie remaining. And as climate change gets exasperated, it gets, gets larger and larger, you're going to need these habitats or you need these places for these birds and other species to go to. So we need to find a way to build the renewable energy, but we need to find a way to do it that doesn't push out the biodiversity crisis. So when we talk about the amount coming and what, what does that mean? You know, so globally, we've done some analyses to show to meet Paris um, climate agreement goals globally, we would have to have over 10 times the amount of renewable energy built out today over the next 20 to 30 years. So that's a, that's a massive amount of infrastructure build out. And that is, I would just say, to meet more of the minimum climate goals than more of these ambitious goals that are coming more and more. So this is going to happen. And if we just built those where the sun shines the most and the wind blows the most, we could also see a significant setback in our carbon emission goals. And that would just be from the land clearing associated with these energy systems. So if you build them in a forest, et cetera, it could set us back up to 8%, which, uh, with, which included with some of these key biodiversity areas that we wanna protect, that's kind of a one step forward, two steps back approach to climate and nature. And it's, it's just, again, we, we can't afford these delays. So, we know that globally. Now, when we think about it in the US, that means the US is gonna have to put a, a, a ton of energy on the ground too. So recently Princeton University modeled out a scenario for what would it take for the United States to get to net zero emissions by 2050. So a way that we are producing as much clean energy as we are you know, pr producing with fossil fuels and we have net zero emissions. And what they, what they found is to do that, it would, create a massive amount of renewable energy that would take up the land area of roughly Colorado and Wyoming combined. You know, so that's that's a lot of land we're talking about and the energy associated with it. Again, as Brian said, it's going to hit every community. But just because of the way that these utility scale systems work, they're more likely to be placed in areas that are windy, flat, and sunny. And the central United States in general is windy, flat, and sunny. Now, you know, obviously we, we, we have our formations too, but it's gonna disproportionately take a lot of that impact and a lot of that build out. So while all models are wrong in their own way, this, this kind of gets close to where 
we've been already with the build out where most of it's already happening out here. So then we need to think about how can we make that technically feasible and what does that look like? So when you talk to renewable energy developers, the first thing they'll say is, there's a lot of stuff we think about when we develop an energy system. It's not just this one issue. We have to think holistically about the problem, which we totally understand and appreciate. And so we did an analysis to look at, okay, so if you think about all the areas that are technically feasible for renewable energy developers to develop, then if you can look at all of these areas that have relatively high conservation value, and luckily or unluckily in our region, there, there is not as many of those areas because it's been so fragmented and developed that we, it's really critical for us to keep those corridors together. So if you look at those two things, and then you do just sort of a simple analysis to take the areas that have low impact, that have renewable energy potential, but have habitat, take them off the table. What you're left with are areas that have renewable energy potential and you know, from an environmental perspective should be less conflict and, and, and have less worries. And what, and what we see is that we have over just from a wind energy perspective alone, we have over a thousand gigawatts what we're calling low impact wind potential. So these are areas that are windy that don't have necessarily wildlife related concerns or risks and could be developed. And I, you know, obviously that's a lot of um, energy that's basically equivalent to the, to the entire US electrical system to date. We're not saying we're gonna build all of that in the central US alone. We're saying is we have more than enough opportunity that we can focus on avoidance, focus on making sure that we, we get the best project on the ground. And of course, in these low impact areas, we need to make sure that communities are involved in the decision making. And so when we think about that beyond just the environmental side, how do you bring social accounts into it? We, we also have strategies to think about that. So for example, in New York, we've worked with the Long Island community to develop a solar roadmap that provides resources for both homeowners, for developers, for city planners to understand what is the solar resource of my community and then what are the different tools or pathways that I could use to access that solar resource? So we're sure that this energy gets in the ground as equitably as possible. Um, that felt like a lot of things to think about, Nathan. And also I think that maybe brains are going like <laughs> as they think about that scale. But I, I mean, I think that that real tangible example of, okay, and then here are some things that we're putting in place so people help to think about that. Maybe you could say, a little bit more about the sort of incentive side and and what you all think about as the incentives that will help us get it right. Yeah, uh, of course. And you know, I think I'll start by saying as is probably pretty obvious the US electrical system is is a very complex system, so I, you know, we could spend all day on this. Um, and on the renewable side, you know, we're, we're just now building out a lot of these policies. So we're we're building the ship as we're steering it. But we do think there are some opportunities to think about this. And so, you know, first, in terms of context and recognizing, a lot of renewable energy is built on private lands. There's no one overarching policy framework that's going to get this thing right. It's, it's going to be thinking about how do, you bring, how do you bring local communities together? How do you bring state governments together? How do you bring federal government agencies together? How do you bring stakeholders and developers together to, to, to make something work? But we think overall, a framework that does work is one that if we think about this smartly, we can, we can go more quickly on the build out. So if we can think thoughtfully about how we plan, site and buy renewable energy, we have an opportunity to influence this build out. And so at a high level, when we think about planning, it's just making sure everyone's at the table. It's making sure all of the latest available science plus the appropriate stakeholders are all coming together to create these long-term energy plans that do guide a lot of the decision-making and investments for grid infrastructure and et cetera. And we need to make sure that the that renewables are thought holistically both on impacts and co-benefits to make sure the right decisions are being made. On the siting side, it's a lot of what I, what I said, you know, can you provide the right resources? Can you develop the right frameworks, guidelines? Think about renewable energy zones. There's a whole bunch of policy opportunities that can be done to help developers develop renewable energy quickly. And then just lastly, on the buying side, it's recognizing the role of, the, of renewable energy buyers in the market as they're driving market and they have a lot of more flexibility than say, than say a consumer like you or I do in terms of what energy they use. So they can ask developers, you know, give us the project that are that is low impact, that has community approval, et cetera. So then you drive the market into these, into the market we all want to see. I yeah, I really, really appreciate all of that. And that that whole notion, Nathan, of community approval, I think sort of speaks to some of the stuff that I hear Brian, you talking about a lot, and that is that sort of social license to operate. So I, Brian, maybe you could describe to folks, what does that mean? And a little bit about 
I think also what Nathan was starting to tee up, which is this idea of like proactive engagement, right? Like getting the community to come together and share a voice. So talk to us a little bit about what you mean by those terms. Yeah, well, I, I, uh, you mean social license to operate? This is something that comes up every day in conversation. Um, it, it is, it is a, uh, it, it's an interesting concept, but it, it, and it's a little bit of an academic term, but it's something that, uh, that we saw a lot of uh, actually in, in the energy industry, the oil industry used uh, about their, uh, their, their rigs and drilling apparatus and all the things that kind of come in, which are, are not necessarily very attractive and very industrial, but need to be where they need to be uh, in order to, uh, for, the, for the economic activity to occur. A social license to operate uh, is really talking about a social acceptance of a land use or type of development. Um, it's an assumption that's shared by the community that the land use, that this particular land use has a legitimate place in the community. Um, something like uh, retail, commercial, or housing, you know, generally, uh, is, is pretty universally understood that it has a legitimate place in the community. Nobody says, we don't need any housing or we don't need retail commercial. That doesn't mean that every project is accepted and there's plenty of people who will oppose particular projects but most people will say that it's needed somewhere in the community. Large scale solar projects are really a new kind of land use and people don't understand the benefits uh, or the risks associated with it. And therefore it really, it, it's not granted a social license. People don't see why it needs to be in their community. Uh, in order for these solar, solar projects to have a social license, people really need to understand the place that it has in their community. They need to understand that they have, they, the community, have a solar resource that has economic value um, and that, that this, this form of development is something that is legitimate and needs to be accommodated in some form at the community scale. So as long as, as communities see so, solar development as something that's imposed on them from the outside or something that isn't benefiting them, it really will have no social license and will face opposition or even uh, uh, face some attempts to push it out of the community entirely. So uh, this whole concept of social license to operate is really about how do we, uh, those of us who kind of see that, 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 that there's legitimate need uh, in order to meet our climate goals to have this expansion uh, of, of solar development, how do we help communities uh, kind of understand and prepare for solar development? Uh, one of the things that we do, for instance, have been going around and helping uh, county governments understand the, the market for solar energy that there is, that this is something that is not a, it's not necessarily a uh, um, just a green thing, but rather something where solar energy is now the cheapest form of energy uh, generation, electric energy generation in the world on an energy, internet, per energy uh, mm -hmm. unit basis, on a per kilowatt hour basis. People are demanding it. The market wants it. You community have a solar resource. Someone's going to want to take advantage of that. How do we understand that that communities have solar resources? How do we understand that this is a legitimate land use and they need to make sure this happens, however, in a way that it is benefiting the community itself. There's yeah. taxes that are generated, of course, and things like that. But the, how do we get to, how do we really get to that point of social license to operate? Yeah, and Brian. I mean, you sort of said this is like an academic term and, and a lot of times in certs we talk about how do you do this development with community, not to community. And it, and it seems like that's exactly what you're describing. You know, one of the things that I've also heard you describe is, you know, you're talking to folks to make sure that they really understand, you know, that this is an opportunity and that they have a voice and a say but you've also been working to help folks understand what the benefits are and, and more than just the sort of revenue stream. But you, you talk about this term of value stacking. I think of it as like the sandwich or maybe it's the ice cream sundae if we wanna really think about it in a, like the best way possible. But describe what you mean about solar value stacking and, and how, how you're, what, like what, what are those values that you're stacking and what does that mean for ag land and what does it mean for water and natural resources? Say a little bit more about that. Uh, sure, yeah, it, this is kind of the, the co-benefits approach to solar development that, 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 that we, we've been uh, trying to champion around. Uh, and it's, it's understanding the, the, um, the, the, that uh, the 
call benefits of a form of development sometimes are just as important as the the intent of the development. So with solar energy, we, we look at something like, I mean, wh- why do we do solar energy development? We do it in order to produce clean energy, right? That, that's the that's the purpose of it. But that's but if you do the development right, you can create co-benefits along with that that have a direct benefit to the community. And some of the things like jobs, job creation, tax revenue uh, to the community, uh, I- increased or improved rents to landowners are kind of some of the economic things that go are associated with all forms of development. With solar development, you have some particularly unique aspects to actually create co-benefits if you do your both your siting choices and your site design choices correctly. Uh, you can capture things like uh, creation of habitat uh, that uh, the, the, the pollinator standard that we have here in Minnesota, habitat friendly pollinator standard uh, is one of those examples where by doing uh, ground cover that, that has uh, um, habitat value for pollinators, you're actually going to create thousands of acres, tens of thousands of acres as we build out the solar system. Uh, the in, in 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 habitat that's going to have other kinds of benefits. Uh, also associated with that is our water quality benefits. We have a couple of examples where we're working with kind of win win wins, where uh, by by putting solar onto drinking water recharge areas um, where that that are currently in agriculture um, and that are being contaminated by nitrates because they're prime farmland. Uh, they have a high economic value. The landowners want to use that economic value to, for, for their return. Uh, and the community has an economic base that is in rural areas that's, that's associated with agriculture. However, it's contaminated in a green drinking water supply. What about if you put a solar array on the drinking water sy- system where the ag producer is going to get um, just as good or sometimes even uh, much better return on its value of the land um, you're going to take land out of ag production, perhaps, but you're also going to um, be protecting the drinking water supply area for the community, uh, and and the uh, and uh, uh, the, so the community is benefiting from that. The that you're going to get the tax revenue from the from the solar development. You're going to get um, you're going to uh, the 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 rural landowner is going to avoid having the uh, headaches of trying to to manage nitrates. Uh, on on the um, on the land, uh, and and is going to get a better return than they would have um, with land in agriculture. So yeah. that's kind of one example of how that how that all fits together, and it fits with the agricultural and um, kind of uh, farmland preservation aspects that we also see. Because every acre that you put onto a drinking water supply area is an acre you don't have to put on prime farmland elsewhere. Right. Right. Um, yeah. And, and I'm sort of channeling my inner Fritz Ebinger. Um, and if you can do actual ag production, like have grazing or something underneath there, there is that sort of, again, additional benefit. But yeah, I mean, I, I like sort of the different scenarios of how you could stack that up and how it would come together. Thank you, Brian, so much. Um, Sarah, Brian has just been talking a lot about um, solar, but I know that when I first <laughs> when I first learned about your work, it was it was more about wind energy and what that research was that you were doing and and I know that I got really excited as I was hearing about, oh, somebody's looking at like how the process really influences how people feel about a project. Um, and, and that whole notion of like community acceptance and sense of place seems to be really strong in all of your work. So I'm wondering if you could describe to folks what your research is about and how that research informs your thinking about this whole notion of siting. Sure. Um... So I think it's helpful to start like back at the beginning. (laughs) You mentioned that my first research project was about whether or not wind energy is a farmland preservation technique. Um, The spoiler alert from three years of research is that it is. Um, And it's really important. And it goes back to something that um, Brian was just saying about stacking is that wind development really allows farmers an opportunity to to diversify their revenue stream. So it's not replacing farming, it's supplementing farming in a lot of places. Um, And my work effectively found like farmers are reinvesting the money they receive from wind turbines into their farms and they're able to shore up succession plans, right? So this is again, a new opportunity for them on that. But in the process of doing that research, I realized that like this idea of farmland preservation was really true and resonated with farmers in all of the communities that I studied. But there were really different community-wide reactions to the wind farms 
in these communities. Um, some wanted more wind development after they had their first project and others were like, we're all done. We, you know, we've done our fair share. We don't want any more. And I was also seeing some, some of the same reactions among communities that didn't have projects yet. You know, some were like, we definitely don't want this here. And some were saying like, please come to our community. And so a lot of my work since then has been trying to understand that. Like, why do communities react differently? Um, Brian mentioned like the social license to operate. And that is a, there's a, a bunch of work in the academic literature as he talked about that effectively says negative community reaction is a res result of not enough community engagement or on one hand or not enough community benefits and there's i definitely like have seen that in my own work right when we found that when people say they have um when people tell us that they have a say in the planning process um or um or sorry when they tell us that they didn't have a say, when to Brian's point, they feel like the, the project was kind of foisted onto their community, they have a lot of negative attitudes during the planning process, you know, when the project is being developed. But what we find is that those attitudes continue long after that wind farm has been built. People don't just like learn to live with wind turbines. Um, so to that point, we've been trying to do, I've been trying to do a bunch of work in Michigan to get communities to be proactive and talk about what kind of renewable energy they think fits in their community and where they think it fits, even before a wind or solar developer shows up. But I'm not going to lie, like, I'm in, coming from planning, like, in all things, like, it's easy to react to a proposal, but it's really difficult to motivate conversations to happen ahead of time. I'm still pushing because I still think that that's important. Um, but I don't think it's the only thing that's important. Another part of kind of the puzzle to like why communities respond differently to projects is really about community benefits. A lot of that work is about economic community benefits, not some of the more intangibles that Brian was talking about, but you could certainly think about it that way. Um, Initially, as an example of this, like initially in Michigan, wind developers were only paying people who had wind turbines on their property. So there were, you know, a couple dozen people getting paid and they were, it was a sizable check. But then that model shifted in Michigan, in part because we have a whole bunch of people who have rural houses, but don't own very much land. So they're not, they don't have enough space to have a wind turbine sited there. And developers started to take a model more similar to oil and gas development, where everybody in the vicinity of the wind project has some direct financial stake in that project. And one of the things I think, Lisa, going back to like where we first met each other, like one of the things that my research finds is that sharing that money, even if it's the same pot of money, among more people generally makes for less contention in that community. Even then though, that is not like the be all end all. <laughs> like, you know, even in projects where people are following all of the best practices, um, there are still some that are more contentious than others. And um, I think this is like the most recent work that I've been doing is trying to figure out whether there's some sort of demographic or landscape characteristics that lead to contention. Um, and we find that there are. <laughs> um, in places with lots of agricultural production and where the economy is really based on agriculture and that's why people are living there. Wind energy is not as contentious. I, you know, this is not a direct survey question, but my sense in that is that people see energy generation as another way for the land to be productive. But in communities where people live for aesthetic reasons and in Michigan, we have a lot of those, a lot of not just the Great Lakes, but the Inland Lakes. And I think that's something that, you know, you see in Minnesota too. Um, the wind is much more contentious. Um, and I think that among the reasons is that it is a change to the landscape. You cannot camouflage a 500 or 600 foot wind turbine, right? So I think coming full circle, and this is something that Brian highlighted just a little bit, is like when we talk about farmland preservation and even in the like your framing of this, like what can we do to protect farmland, we mean lots of different things by farmland preservation. So like if I look at the plans, like the land use plans for those those amenity kind of communities, there are goals about farmland preservation, but it's not often about the farmer. 
It's about preserving the views, right? Like you want to preserve a farming landscape. Um, and so sometimes there's conflict um, between the goals of the farmers and those of the vacation homeowners or the people who've retired to that. Um, and I think even though they're using the same term, they don't mean the same thing. And this is why it's really important for communities to have these conversations about what the community is all about and how different land uses. I mean, I really, you know, I talk a lot about energy, but it's not, energy is not the only kind of land use, but like how different land uses fit in. Mm. It's really, I mean, it's interesting, Sarah, because I mean, I've been in community meetings where I'll have somebody say, you know, I really love solar, but I don't like wind. And somebody else will say, I really like wind, but I don't like solar. And and they live in the same place and they have different reasons and rationale like you're describing. And it, it makes me wonder, and, and maybe I'll start with you, but bring in Fritz and, or Brian and Nathan too, but I, I'm sort of curious, you know, you've learned a lot about wind and I'm wondering about sort of how we think about solar and then even like transmission, because I mean, technically feasible, Nathan, to your very early, like, what is the developer thinking about? Where's the substation, right? Like, how am I going to connect? So how do we think about this, those two things as well and and think about ways to mitigate those like visual impacts the sense of place impacts uh, sarah maybe you start well i mean from somebody who studies farmland preservation like solar is very interesting because there are lots of opportunities to stack it with agricultural services or ecosystem services right if you're valuing the rural landscape for the ecological value but that's not necessarily the default um, and so like how solar fits really depends on how it's practiced. Are you stacking systems, right? Um, and absolutely, like I, in part, just because the cost of solar has come down. So the center of gravity for energy development across the Midwest has really swung from wind to solar. Um, we're starting to see a lot of these same conversations play out. Like, and it's some of the same things on solar. Did we have a say in the project? Who is benefiting from this? Just a couple of people or lots of people? How does this fit with our vision of what our community is all about? Um, I would say whether you're talking about solar or transmission, like thinking about those issues, you know, what is the process? Who is benefiting? And like, what are the benefits? And like, there's not a, there's not a, prototypical example that I think would fit in every community because every community is different. Like, I think you have to, you have to think about that, like building, allowing for an energy transition, right? Like we're in the process of transition. It's just like how willingly people go along, but it's going to require a change to landscapes. Um, and I think what's hard to Nathan's point is like, it seems, it seems slower to engage communities. Like there's a lot of work up front to figure out where it fits and what kind of energy technology fits and how much is too much energy infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I think that that's really what's going to be needed um, to get communities on board, like, and help them identify, like, what energy opportunities work for them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, and like I said, it's going to be different from place to place. Like, there's yeah. no universal. <laughs> and, and maybe pause there. I mean, the thing that you're bringing up is making me think about sort of we, when we talk about equity and equitable, you know, community engagement and development and all of that, we do often hear people saying like, this will just take too much time. And yet we find, I think, Nathan, to your earlier comment, like if we don't take the time, actually taking the time will help us go faster in the end, because otherwise people might say, mm, hold on. Right. So Nathan, do you have a couple of examples of places where you feel like, you know, this was a good example? <laughs> I mean, knowing that every community is different, right? But anything that comes to mind for you? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a couple studies out there that we've been working on where obviously every community comes at this from a different perspective. So if you think about the prime farmland, prime farmland in Minnesota means a lot different than prime farmland in New York or California where it's a little more limited. So we really have to think about the context and the scale and making sure we bring in that context. But uh, for example, out in California, there was a, a study that showed the developers that went through sort of above and beyond um, environmental considerations, really thinking upfront about how are they going to avoid these resources? How do they engage the 
community saw that their permitting times decreased by upwards of 15% compared to the projects that did not go through that level of sort of certification and thinking about it, you know, so th that's, that might be, you know, more sort of business focused, but, but that's how we're, that's how we're going to have to see these things go down. And then I, then I think elsewhere, you know, there's, there's a lot of different interesting models being set up, especially along the Northeast. Uh, the New York state just recently did a interesting policy, um, evolution. Uh, Massachusetts has done some work. So, so all of these states are trying to handle this a little differently, but I think overall the, 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 the idea that it, we're coming back to is if you, if you engage these resources up front, it's going to create less conflict. And, you know, from in our organization, we always say conservation happens at the speed of trust, you know, and I think this is the same where it's, you know, you've got to bring the communities in early and often. Brian, I, I wonder, you know, one of the things that I hear a lot of folks talking about in Minnesota is that it's great to have these large scale developments, but also like, let's not forget <laughs> that roofs are available and and that people are gonna have it on their own businesses, on their own government buildings, on their own homes and all of that. And you've talked about like host, host sites and host communities are gonna be everywhere. How do you think about those pieces and like those different scales as you think about this kind of development? Uh, uh, well, that, that's not, and that's that's the the, the million dollar question I think right now of what we're seeing we're seeing a lot of the the, the debate. Uh, there has been a lot of emphasis on kind of large scale, but there's there are different scales of solar development that are actually very different kinds of land uses, uh, and and we we shouldn't put we shouldn't bundle. And this is one of our this is one of our primary zoning messages that we tell the communities is just because it's solar doesn't mean it's the same thing. A uh, you know a uh, uh, an, an airplane manufacturing hangar uh, and the shed in your backyard are both buildings, uh, but they're not the same land use. Um, so we need to think about them differently because they are different land uses and they have different impacts and they actually have different benefits to the community. Um, we, we, in fact, we, we typically uh, scale solar development at the distributed scale, what we would typically call a behind the meter kind of rooftop installation. Uh, at the community scale, which is usually something like, um, you know, an a, a install on land, but it's only going to be five or 10 or maybe 15 acres, and it can fit into the landscape and into the existing land use patterns frequently within communities. And then there's large scale, where you're talking about hundreds or even thousands of acres, where you can't fit it into the, the, the land, the, the, the existing structure of the landscape uh, in your community. Uh, but 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 you can you can kind of you can do that in the best way possible through siting and site design. So the, the 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 you can get to a large amount of our need for solar um, by doing rooftop installations. However, it's a very different land use and it's a different development format. Uh, and you need a you need to take a an, 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 a, a portfolio approach here, right? You need it needs to be uh, we need we need to have rooftop solar because it provides unique benefits in terms of resilience, in terms of who's economically benefiting, in terms of kind of the ability to actually structure uh, and tie solar directly to loads, you know, that, that we would use. Um, we need to have a community scale solar in order to kind of fit it in the landscape and really maximize benefits to the landowner as it fits within their, their um, scale of development. Uh, and then we need large scale really to capture the, the economies of scale that you get. Um, you know, without a doubt, utility scale is the cheapest on a per kilowatt hour uh, level to, to build. Mm -hmm. uh, but, it, but, um, but it needs to be interconnected to the transmission system. Kind of you go back to a point that Sarah was talking about. If you don't have a transmission interconnection point or it's limited or constrained, you can't do solar development there. And that's one of those things that if you do want to see solar development large scale in your in your county, for instance, to capture some of those benefits at the at the kind of rural development scale that solar uh, that Sarah was talking about earlier, you need to make sure you have a transmission interconnection. Uh, and it's one of those things that where infrastructure becomes part of the development question for communities as well. They need to engage in those transmission planning dockets, right? In that right. obscure world of, of inter, inter, independent system operators in order to make sure that they have the opportunity um, uh, to have solar development occur where they want it to occur. You can yeah. say, I want it up over here on this, on this drinking water supply area, like I was talking about earlier, but if there's no transmission access there, right. you can't and, do it. 
And Brian, yeah, I, I love that you're bringing that up. We heard from some folks in Massachusetts who are saying, we're gonna have to build out transmission. How about we do the community planning so that we build it in places where we want to see this development, right? And so those are some really interesting models. Um, I think transmission is probably a whole nother topic for us to talk about and some of those revenue sharing and how does that kind of process work as we think about this. I know that in Minnesota, this is a real hot topic right now as well. So that's perhaps a future energy futures session. We are at time and I wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to all three of you for your willingness to do this, for coming and sharing your expertise and ideas and insights. You all, I know, have a bunch of studies that you had referenced as things that people might be interested in reading more about. So we will actually send those out along with the blog to make sure that folks have access to those resources because it's a lot of wide ranging ideas and insights. And I think that that's really always helpful. Um, for all that are here, thank you for being here. We will send out the recording. We'll send it out to everybody who registered as well as those links. We wish you all a great afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you.